every single decision any country makes about energy or any individual makes about energy use for their own home, you need to think about the consequences and people need to think about what the better choices are. I think that uh, the entire planet, the populations of most countries in the world understand that the climate crisis is real. They understand that we human beings are responsible for what is happening because we are burning fossil fuel without capturing emissions. And that creates the warming of the earth, which is creating all kinds of additional challenges uh, to life itself. It's science over years has been accumulating the evidence that defines where we are. We're making incredible progress in certain technologies and people are more and more concerned about the issue but we still have to galvanize it into action that is gonna meet the challenge. If you choose to deal with this crisis and we get it done, we will not be seeing 7 million people a year, including women and children all over the world, dying because of the bad quality of the air they're forced to breathe. We will not see people starving because we have totally imploded the food production capacity of an Africa or of South Asia or somewhere. And we're seeing that happen today. The Mekong Delta, which I'm personally very familiar with, is, is a great food basket for m m most of Vietnam and for the rest of and countries around there. It is being destroyed because of sea level rise and the salt and the, and the destruction. So we need to be aware that uh, these choices are really fundamental to winning this battle ultimately. Bottom line, if we do what we know how to do and what we're now growing in our capacity, we will have far fewer people die of lung disease because of bad air. We will be far healthier, far less cancer, less microplastics if we adhere to the bailout, you know, to COP16. And, and very importantly, we'll be safer. You don't have to be a nation dependent on your energy from another nation and, and fearful of having to send troops to fight to defend your source of energy. The world will be safer. There'll be less conflict if people don't have to move around the planet as refugees. So there's a building block here of all kinds of uh, physical challenges to people in countries around the world that could be addressed and ameliorated, mitigated by virtue of doing what we need to do now. I think there have been several layers of that meaningful shift. Going back to when I first went to college. In 1962, I enrolled in college and a book came out called uh, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. And it inspired my whole generation, all of our generation was inspired by this. And in 1970, we had something called Earth Day where 20 million Americans came out of their homes demanding clean water, clean air. You couldn't see across New York. You couldn't see across Los Angeles. Uh, a river famously lit on fire in Ohio. And, and that spurred activity. So we passed Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act, Endangered Species Act. And we created the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States and President Nixon signed it into law. Why? Because he saw it was a voting issue. Because his hold on power was affected by what people were demanding. Then there was another great shift after Earth Day uh, when we had the Rio conference, uh, which I remember attending. Uh, it was four years after we'd been warned about the beginning of climate crisis. And uh, we uh, did a great deal at that period of time. We, we actually ended acid rain during those years uh, by creating a new system for trading, uh, which today is, you know, people attack and they've, they've weaponized it. But that was another big moment of shift was when uh, the, 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 that legislation passed and America became much more on the cutting edge of environmental effort. Then, of course, uh, in 92, uh, in Rio, a framework was created, which is the framework that has been followed now for 29 different meetings. Uh, and out of those meetings, Paris was another big moment 
When Paris occurred, it was the first moment that all these nations came together and agreed we should try to get 1.5 degree limit of warming. We certainly should keep it at two degrees as a limit. And everybody agreed to submit a plan for how they were going to get there. That wasn't enough. So we went to Glasgow, we went to Sharm El Sheikh, and then we went to, to Dubai, UAE, where Dr. Sultan Al Jaber and His Highness gave a commitment that they were going to get this done. And they did a brilliant job of bringing people together and coming up with the most powerful uh, mission statement that I've seen to date, specifically, that we should begin. Almost 200 nations agreed we should transition away from fossil fuel in a way that meets net zero 2050, uh, according to the science, and that we must accelerate in this decade. That's the mission. Accelerate, hit the target of 2050 net zero. And that to me is probably the biggest single mission statement that has been accepted by almost 200 countries around the world. Now we have to implement it. If we implement it, we win the battle. If we let that UAE consensus be dropped by the wayside, uh, God knows how much it will cost us and what terrible, terrible consequences we will suffer all around the planet. Well, I think we're seeing leadership. The, the Zion Sustainability Prize is leadership. And that leadership has brought people, look at the number of presidents of countries who are here today, or prime ministers. Uh, that's pretty impressive. And I think it speaks to, and I know from my own experience working with Dr. Sultan, uh, it wasn't always easy for him. With other countries calling up and saying, what are you doing? You know, you're an oil producer, you're a gas producer. Here you are, you know, trying to limit it. And he said, no, we're doing what needs to be done. We all need to be part of this. And in the end, uh, no country stood up and killed it. They realized this is a popular movement. It's growing in its power and it's going to continue to grow. So I think that, uh, you know, there, there are many different pieces of this puzzle that are now coming into greater focus. AI is going to be a key component of managing grids and delivering either molecules or electrons to various places where they're needed. We are deeply, deeply committed to AI. Uh, I've made uh, personal investment in there and uh, company-wise we're invested also. Uh, because we are convinced AI is going to be an essential ingredient. Why? Because it has the ability to process so much more information so much faster and to be able to deliver on target solutions uh, with much greater certainty than we have just with human beings today. Um, the, the reason AI is essential to this transition is you're trying to manage and marry and bring together different grids or different types of businesses. Uh, and the management of data can be essential. There's a company called Alchemy that we're involved with. Uh, you know, First Street uh, is another company. They manage information. They bring in, and you can't win this battle if you're not able to understand and, and define, interpret what the meaning of certain choices are. And the comparative capacity you get out of AI to be able to make those choices is really enormous. You need that information in order to tell where are the greatest risks, where's the greatest potential damage that's going to occur, which is exactly what those companies are doing. So I don't think we can win the battle without the assistance of AI. You can't leave it up to AI. AI is not going to be able to do it on its own, but it's going to be an incredibly useful, essential tool in order to get done what we need to do. And in addition, uh, batteries is a major new transition. We're also seeing nuclear, where small modular nuclear reactors could very well be a very critical part of the solution because in certain places, uh, uh, they will be particularly uh, capable of providing 
firm energy, firm energy meaning reliable energy 24-7, 365. We're also invested in and, and believe in the potential of geothermal to be a critical component of this transition. And we've invested in a small company called Fervo, which is one of the, if not the leader, one of the top leaders in the possibilities of new technology helping to go deeper, to find your heat, to be able to bring that heat to the surface and use that to provide energy. So that's what's exciting. And that's one of the reasons why I believe that uh, we have the potential to win this battle. We just have to pick up the pace. Well, the mechanism is really having the private sector that has the money to come on board to understanding that the economics of this are enormous and there's a benefit to them in investing in it. But um, Galvanize Climate Solutions, which I'm co-chair of, is a very sophisticated and capable investment firm uh, run by a fellow named Tom Steyer, who founded it with Katie Hall, both very experienced long-term investors, both of whom have made a huge amount of money but who believe they have a responsibility to be pushing now to accelerate the transition. So we have joined together uh, precisely to do what I think the private sector is uniquely qualified to do, which is allocate capital, targeting it to those best opportunities for accelerating the transition to the new energy economy. Everything we're focused on in Galvanize is, is not it's not a charity, it's not a giveaway, it's a legitimate make money according to the fundamentals. And the reason for that is part of the purpose of this is to convince all these other reluctant investors in the world that you can actually make money. This is a good proposition, it's not as risky as some people are saying in, in different places. And I think the momentum that is building, for instance, uh, there's, there's a massive amount of activity now in battery development. And batteries are the key to closing the gap between what wind and solar can do on their own. The old saying, when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, what are you going to do? Well, you need storage of, of power, electric, electric power, in order to be able to generate the base load for a factory, for a business, for commercial, I mean, you know, we do depend on our economies working. And so we're not trying to disrupt that economy, we're trying to play to, except to the degree people make very conventional and, and wrong <laughs> decisions, that we would disrupt. But we basically believe in the marketplace, we believe that we can allocate capital far more effectively, we believe we could be investing on a global basis far more effectively, and when people begin to see the returns on these investments, then the market is going to move as a whole. And, and they don't need us or anybody else to try to send the message. We believe entirely in the public component of this, the public input of it. I just gave three years of my life, worked three years of my life as the climate envoy for President Biden. And everywhere we went, we encouraged people to get a compromise that brings the private sector and the public sector and philanthropies and interested parties, advocates, bring them together and, and work on finding uh, the right solution for the right place. It's not one uniform thing that's going to work around the planet. There are many different technologies and many different needs in different places. Uh, but I think what, what's very clear is uh, a, a, a business like, like uh, Galvanize is focused on public equities, that is to say stocks, ownership in companies that people make publicly. We're interested in private credit, which is providing uh, startups and, and even a transitional company uh, some of the capital it needs to be able to do the things it wants to do to retool or to begin to you know, get bigger, faster, and, and uh, be more effective.
I'm very excited about what is happening in Asia uh, and Africa, where people are really saying, whoa, we're going to do our part. Even though we're not the cause of the problem, we need to do our part. So people are beginning to make choices about where their energy base is going to come from. They're transitioning out of certain, like coal. Coal is being transitioned out. Oil being transitioned out. Ultimately, if you can't capture the emissions, there's going to be a problem, obviously, with also gas. But I believe, hopefully, we can capture the emissions. If we can't, other alternatives are now coming online, which will be able to provide us the firm energy, the, the energy that is guaranteed to be going so people can know the hospital will work, the schools will be lit, and that we can continue life as we want it to be. Uh, and you've got to have some certainty about that or people won't accept it. I think the Zayed Sustainability Prize is incredibly important because it empowers people at the local level not to simply be hearing about the climate crisis or feeling they're, dis you know, they're, they're, they're disenfranchised. It gives people power. And, and you see those young kids today who are just so excited to be part of the sustainability journey. I think if you didn't have a, 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 a Zayed Sustainability Prize, you wouldn't have had an amazing group of youngsters here celebrating what they did on their own, the, the, the steps they took to be able to provide clean water, to assist in, you know, in planting mangroves or whatever the choice is. The, the expression on their faces tells you the whole story. Uh, it's, an, it's truly empowering. And those kids will learn, oh my God, I'm only 10 years old, 11 years old, but look at the difference I can make. And they begin to become, you know, prophets in their own community, and that builds. And other kids look at it and say, wow, those kids seem to have something going on. And they just won a big prize, and they went to Abu Dhabi and met uh, His Highness. That's, that's a, a magnet. It draws people to the quest, and that's what we need to do. Politicians aren't going to get there on their own. We need people in the grassroots all around the world to demand clean water, clean air, electricity, the, the things that they ought to have. We don't make it as human beings on this planet. We will not save ourselves from some of the worst consequences of the climate crisis unless we inspire people on a global basis to make better choices and to see the way in which each and every one of them are connected to this challenge. But when you saw, you know, different schools having a project on sustainability or you see one country or another represented by a group that had improved the education system or that had uh, provided clean water to people to be able to drink. I mean, these are the essentials of building community, of developing nation pride, national pride, bringing people together so we forge alliances that are for the good things in life.